dealing with cancer and fighting cancer is a a battle of engaging and re-engaging. And for that brief month or two, I disengaged and I just read. And when he told me I had some some trouble spots, I had to re-engage all over. And mentally, that is challenging. So anyways, we're going through our chop and my body is responding pretty well. You know, I'm doing the red devil. All the nurses. Oh, that's where it came from? We call it the red devil. But you can Google it and it says red devil. So I had that, doing fine, doing fine. And my body was responding so well. If you look on the, the right hand side, that's that's what it looked like when I first walked into the door. That's how bad it was. A couple of weeks later on the left side, that was my scan after that. And that was like a premature scan because he kind of wanted to see what was going on. You could see how much of that cancer was eradicated, just like that, right? And so I was feeling really good. So on my second round of R-CHOP, the nurse said, she come in the room and I see a bunch of needles. And I'm like, whoa, where, this is, where the bags? <laughs> so they started giving me some of the injections in the stomach. And I was like, no. And um, yeah. So she said, Dr. Bo said, you responded so well, we're going to go with some direct shots. And they was putting half of my chemo in my stomach directly because I could handle it. That's how strong my body was. So at the end of our chop, Dr. Bo gave me a couple months off. So immediately when I start feeling well, I jumped right back on the bike. <laughs> so I started back riding and I was feeling good about myself, you know? I was like, well, maybe we won. And so when I had that PET scan and he brought me back in, he said, well, I knew, you know, he said, uh, we got a couple concerning areas. And I said, well, maybe they're dead cells, just not giving up. And he was like, no, nah, I don't think so. And uh, I was like, well, maybe it's this. He was like, no, nah, I don't think so, you know. And so at that point, I was like, okay, I got to re-engage, you know. Dealing with cancer and fighting cancer is a, a battle of engaging and re-engaging. And for that brief month or two, I disengaged and I just read. But when he told me I had some some trouble spots, I had to re-engage all over. And mentally, that is challenging. I You have to have someone to talk to. You have to have a counselor or someone just to talk this out. I started journaling, so I would write it out. And I would talk to myself a lot. And I would talk to my body and I would talk to my cells. And, but anyways, he, uh, we had some, some trouble spots. He said, well, I'm going to send you to the big house, UNC Chapel Hill, the university. That's where the teaching hospital is. And he said, I'm going to send you basically to a uh, specialist there, Dr. Grover. She was amazing. And again, he gave me my options. You know, you can choose to do this. You can, I said, you know what? I said, the UNC family has been really good to me and I felt strong about it. And she told me later on that I was, you know, but that we are because we're still still fighting, you know. Well, we had, you know, stem cell, which has been around for a while, and we hadn't tried targeted radiation. So we hadn't tried that. So, and then there were other types of uh, chemo mixtures. And I knew right then, I said, I, my body needs a break from chemo. That was not going to be an option. Epoch and all those things. No, nah, we're not going to that. And so... I was very interested in CAR-T from a, <clears throat> a scientific standpoint of them taking your cells and modifying them with the, the protein tip to specifically attack cancer. I was like, that's pretty ingenious because cancer, you know, in college, I studied the AIDS virus a lot on my pre-med side and how it can mimic in your body and trick your body into reproducing it because your T cells won't recognize a chromosome tip on it, right? Well, I had mentioned to Dr. Bowles early on when he mentioned chemo. I said, what about CAR-T? Because I had done a lot of research. And he was like, well, that's not available. You know, at the time, CAR-T wasn't available to my specific type, the t histiocyte, And uh, so it wasn't an option. And so when I got to Dr. Grover, she said, Tony, I have great news. She said in December of 2021, CAR-T came online for my specific type. And she said, you qualify for it. So that's what pushed us into CAR-T. 
So that was my option number one, and that's the option she presented. So we went through CAR T. You have to do an honest assessment of how you're feeling coming out of this pet chemo, and it can be rough. And if you feel like your body can't handle that, seek second opinions. Because if your body telling you it can't handle any more of this, it can't. You may need a break if you can afford to have a break. But if there's other opportunities, make sure you understand what they are because you don't if you don't feel right and you don't feel good, you can't continue down that path. You have to have a, a, a space of time where your body can gather itself. That that's what I encourage more so than anything. Understand your body and understand how much more of this you can take. Pay attention to what your levels are and pay attention to how your organs are responding. And that will tell you what your course of action should, should be. Because if your heart starts failing, because, you know, you have to get the EKGs, you know about that. And, you, you know, they test your liver and they test your kidneys to make sure everything is at a place that it could handle another round or another series of chemo. That's the question that you have to ask yourself. How am I feel, feeling physically? And if your doctor say you're at a point that we're not as concerned with it, you know, spreading rapidly, you know, if it's not doing that, pause a little bit just to get your mind and get your body back together so you can engage again. And that's what I would encourage more so than what treatment you're seeking. Don't be so quick to rush into one treatment into the next into the next because that degradation would take place in your body at some point. It's very important. Just the word practice in medicine is exactly what it is. It's practice. You know, unfortunately, they do the best they can through what they what they're dealing with and their education and, and what they've been exposed to, but it's still practicing medicine, right? That was my most um difficult time, the CAR T. Just simply because I, I was just so uncertain. I was almost I was saying to myself, like, okay, I went through our child and what if this CAR T that's over a million some dollars, right? Doesn't work. What's better than that? You know, for a moment, my mind would go there and say, if this don't work, what's after that? What do you do after that? And um, and so we went through the CAR-T. The chemo depletion was very hard for me. They take you to the edge of those three days. I had three days worth of chemo depletion. Day one, I sat there. And the thing about it, if I can explain to people that don't have our situation, when you're sitting there, you can be full of life and your eyes can be all bright and bubbly. But when you when that chemo start coursing through your veins, it's almost like a dimness come over your body. And you can feel an extraction of life just coming out of you. It's like getting close to death. And having that chemo depletion, which is, it is exactly how it sounds, they depleted my body to the point that there was nothing that it would accept those CAR T cells in the blood that they was giving. And I remember the first day that it hit me so hard. And I went through six rounds of r and I didn't feel like that because they would always give me something to try to bring me back, right? After I would have my, my round of chemo, they would give me the white blood cell shot and help me boost myself back. But this time it was none of that. And so I could feel like my essence leaving me after that first day. and they took me through the back entrances of the hospital, right? Let's say if the president came or Michael Jordan had to go to the hospital, you would go through entrances. Nobody could see you, right? I was going through those secret entrances to get up to the CAR T center, and because um, you had to be away from people because you had no immune system at that point. And the first day, I felt so bad. It's like, man, and you had to be within 15 minutes of the hospital. So I live an hour and something away, so I had to kind of move up there. So I stayed in a sick house, which is kind of like a Ronald McDonald house for grownups. That's kind of how I explain it. And uh, the second day, I remember going up, and there was a chapel. Was, I always would pass the chapel on the back entrances going up. And I went into that chapel, and I, I broke down crying because I remember just crying, and I said, Lord, I can't do this. It it drained me so bad, Steph. I felt like I couldn't do any more. I said, I can't. I can't do this. 
And I sat in that chapel about five or 10 minutes. And then that calm voice said, yes, you can. You've been doing it all along. Go, get out of here. And I got myself up, dried my tears up, sat in that chair and had my second day. And I did the same thing the third day. So <clears throat> after your three days, you have to go to somewhere, whether you stand in a hotel or wherever you stand, it has to be within 15 miles of the, the hospital. So I stayed at the SACU house and um, just started my rehab and recovery. And the people there were great. They cook food for you. You meet other cancer patients in your same situation. The first seven days, typically they tell you maybe 30 days you have to be there, depending on how you respond. And you have to go to the hospital every day for labs. My first seven days, I had no symptoms, feeling great. I was sitting there talking to my CAR T cells because I talked to my body and I said, you guys are my special forces. And every night or every day, I would check in with them and say, hey, what you, what you guys doing? And they'll say, execute, executing boss. And I would talk to myself literally like that was like, execute, go into the highway and the byways in my body and find cancer and kill it. You know, I was just talking to my body. And uh, after the seventh day, my nurses was like, my head nurse was like, you're doing so well. We're going to let you go home. I had no fevers because CAR T, one of the main symptoms they want to check for if you have fevers. And if you have that, you can't go. So they let me go home after seven days. Stayed home. This was maybe on a Wednesday. That Friday, I got super sick. Fever 102, 103, 104. And I wound up going back to the hospital and stayed for 10 days. And so my doctor was joking. She said, you was my little superstar and you wound up back in here, you know? But that was my CAR-T experience. I didn't have any other side effects. Typically the same side effects you would have with, with R-CHOP or EPOC or any of the other ones, right? No sweats, none of that. The fever was the only thing that showed up. And after they determined how to get that down and I actually broke it, they let me go back home and I've been home ever since. So I haven't, hadn't changed. Haven't went back. I mean, just a moment checkups. But um, that's, that's kind of where we are now. You know, simultaneously, I don't think I told you, but I found me a holistic doctor too. So I was doing holistic medicine in conjunction with the chemo. You know, I was taking turkey tail mushroom and different lion's mane mushroom and soursop and, you know, researching holistic doctors in other countries that may not have the the scientific approach as as the the developed countries, but some of them rely on Mother Nature, who provides us with everything that we need too. So I start looking at other plants and other herbs and things that can help me detox. Detox is important. As quickly as you can detox chemo and chemicals out your body, the more readily your body will be if you have to do it again. So I was looking at different options to detox myself outside of traditional medicine. And so that was one opinion that I got, you know, what, what plant can I eat? What food helps with this? All these things, because you don't want to just keep adding chemicals to your body. You know, they give us chemo, then they give us these other pills to take to help with this and that. But sometimes mother nature gives you that and your body is readily absorbing that versus a tablet. I told them, I would tell them what I'm taking because I was taking ashwagandha and different things like that. And some of that may affect chemo because chemo is strong and it is designed to, to do what it does. And sometimes you can alter that, or alter how it works by taking some of these things. So, but you know, if I can encourage the people, your physician and your, your team matters and you have to feel good about them. If you don't feel good about them, Find someone that you do. That's that's as plain as I can say it because they affect everything about your situation. If you don't feel loved or feel like they care, then what the treatment that they're giving you, you're not going to have confidence in that. And so make sure you feel good about them. And then we had another PET scan. And this is where we are today. So we had the PET scan. I finished uh, CAR-T in December of 22. And um, so we had another uh, PET scan January. And um, I believe it was. And uh, we found some cells that wasn't kind of unsure about what they were doing. It took up some of the isotope and it lit up 
But I told Dr. Grover the same thing. I said, maybe they're dead. Maybe they're dead. So maybe they're dead. She was like, nah, nah. She was the same way. Like, mm, don't think so. You know, just kind of dismissing what I was saying. Like, nah, I'm telling you, not this time. Not, mm -mm. And so that I was very discouraged <clears throat> because I was like, man, you know, I put a lot of faith in, in the CAR T process. But all hope wasn't lost because we were unsure. So um, the spot that I still had resonating was in the original area. It was very difficult to get to. So she wanted to do a biopsy. So they went through my hip to get to it. And so she told me, you know, they took 16 to 18 samples and they were decent samples that we could tell what's what. And if you believe in miracles, I would say this is a miracle moment. So when I met with Dr. Grover on the results, she said, Tony, I don't know. She was like, it looked like someone had pinched. If you can imagine pinching your cell and smashing it and just excreting everything in it, like you're squeezing something really, really tight. That's how that cell looked. And she was like, and so the report said no lymphoma found. And I was like, that's a miracle, right? That's a miracle. But doctors don't deal in those terms, so they're never going to give you a certain... They're not going to say certain things. They're not going to give you certainty on anything because they don't... You know, just disclosure, right? And protect themselves. But we both were smiling. I was smiling like it said, no lymphoma found. It was inconclusive. And, and, I, and I had another moment of victory, right? Because typically when they give you that report, it's like a whole page. This, 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 this. So when the radiologist gave the report, it was only like five lines. That's all he said. It looked like this and no lymphoma found or whatever it was. And so that was a win for me. Celebrate the wins. I asked my body to um, to respond every time I get knocked down. And it has. And I think that's just my faith. Right? That's the promise that I believe that God told me that I hold on to. You know, a lot of times it don't have to make sense to a lot of people. It just has to make sense to you because that's what's keeping you going. So if you're putting your faith in that, that's what's keeping you going. I don't care what nobody else thinks. You know, eliminate the background noise. My my biggest impact was when I stayed at the sacred house and I saw so many people that were more worse than me. And that encouraged me. And they were in there cooking breakfast for us, and making lunch and dinner for us. You know, people that could barely move because they were giving back. And even in spite of their situation, and no, no matter how they felt, they were willing to give back. And I said, my life will not be the same. I'm, I'm going to give back. You know, I can't wait till I get some clearance runway. You have to be selfish to protect yourself while you're going through this. But you also have to be accepting that maybe I can help somebody. Maybe I can do something. You know, maybe I can be a difference in somebody else's life while they're going through this. Maybe I can volunteer at the cancer ward. When you can look beyond your situation and you're looking into somebody else's life and trying to help them, it will help your situation, right? It's, it's that faith, right? Believing in something strong enough that you know the outcome on this end will be for you. Believing in somebody else strong enough saying your outcome can be this, right? That's angel work. That is powerful, man. That's angel work. It may seem difficult. It may seem bleak at times, but stay steadfast. Don't let outside sources influence you. Stay steadfast. Even in your darkest moments, 